I'm Dustin Harder, and this is Keep On Cooking. Hello, and welcome to Keep On Cooking, the only podcast dedicated to plant based cookbooks. I'm your host, Dustin Harder, and you better check yourself, Loretta, before you wreck yourself. It's my husband and producer of the podcast, David Rossetti. How you doing, Roro? Roro is doing good, good. Oh, good, good. How are you, you? <laughs> You're welcome. I know I don't have one. You've got the cool, but cool row row. I'm great. Everyone um calls like when David directs shows, especially like if you do youth shows, like yes. high school shows, yes. they they call him row row, Mister Mister row row, Mister row row. If you're nasty, uh, well, or or not, or not, <laughs> or not. <laughs> oh well, we have a book we have been waiting so patiently to share yes. with you. So patiently, as have you been, been waiting? Yes, been waiting, waiting to hear Anything about this book about. Mm -hmm. it is the herbivorous butcher cookbook 75 plus recipes for plant-based meats and all the dishes you can make with them now this book of course is an extension of their butcher shop the herbivorous butcher opened by siblings aubrey and kale walsh in 2016 the herbivorous butcher gained a cult following in minneapolis and beyond when it opened that's right i mean when they launched in 2016, they were it was it was banana. Everybody was talking about it. They were not. It was, it was not just like the talk of the town. No, no, no. Like they were the talk of the globe. The world was a booze over I think them. It was kind of. I think it was because they used the word butcher, like her butcher. Oh yeah, butcher, and I believe it like... it's the first vegan butcher shop in the world. But I know I don't want to say there's controversy. In that. I think there's someone else who also claims it somewhere. But I to me. The Herbivorous Butcher will forever and always be the very first vegan butcher shop. The OG. The OG. Um, and we even filmed an episode of The Vegan Roadie there. That's season right. two, episode seven. You can go check it out. And our cameraman, Drew, uh, you know, Drew Williams, he did everything for season one, season two. Not just cameraman. He directed, edited, all these things, all these wonderful things. But not vegan. He still, to this day... Yeah, loses his mind mm -hmm. over he'll be like oh my god that cheese we had at the rivers butcher and, and so um that was one of the coolest things about that show was when i was traveling with drew since he wasn't vegan he would try these things and he would just sort of lose, lose his, his mind, mind right? yeah. yeah um and we would be amiss in this moment not to mention their outstanding media manager yes. um, and queen of all there just uh, a woman of all trades and one of our favorite absolute favorite people on the planet laura van zandt we love you yes. we love you yes 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 we have to shout out our uh, love to laura we love you so much she has literally uh, brought jerky across state lines for us yes. she's <laughs> quite because actually, inter internationally internationally she i think took, she, yeah, she yeah, brought yeah. them to uh ireland when by, we went. by yeah. request yes by request. because i think that might be your favorite I herbivorous favorite. butcher item i mean i jerky there's a minimum amount of stuff that like you can get as opposed to like being in the shop, I actually haven't gone to the shop yet, which I, I oh wanna... my god, yeah, I know, I know, you've been to it so many times that I've been to it <laughs> zero. Um, so uh, it really is just jerky when I David, can get it. we have got to get you to the herbivorous. You would lose your mind know, though. No, you got to take your wallet, baby, because you're gonna spend I know, some money. But, but you need to take your wallet and a cooler, and we'll and a cooler, pack a right, cooler up right. for you. But um. But the HB does sell their products yes. in uh, regional Whole Food locations, and they ship, uh, you know, a wide range of products over all the 50 states um, and Puerto Rico. Their fans have been ardently asking for their recipes, and here they are for the first time in this book. Yes, can you believe it? It's oh. finally here. Yes, and we love, we love ourselves some pepperoni in this house, mm -hmm. David's. Uh, one of the, I think it was your last thing before you finally were like, sure. okay, I'm vegan. Like, yeah. you had trouble giving up pepperoni. That was tough. Because you like pepperoni pizza. That's that's the reason. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we made the pepperoni in this book, and it's it's it was perfect. It was easy. It was perfect. It was uh it was sort great. of like perfectly spiced. You get that zesty pepperoni, and mm -hmm. the texture was great. Texture Everything was about great. it was so good. I made a few other things from this book, and, and we chat all about them in the interview, of course, among all of the other recipes that we chat about. Yeah, so in this book, there are 75 innovative recipes for plant-based meats and standout vegan dishes. Uh, these are butcher shop classics, such as like a pork Classics. Chops, classics. Doom, doom, doom. Uh, pork chops, ground beef, um, chicken cutlets uh, that taste uh, and chew as good as the real thing. 
perfect for vegans as well as anyone who wants to eat uh, less meat. That's right. And you can use the base recipes in this book or store-bought store substitutes. So they give you that option as well because we know everyone and they know everyone. Either maybe you don't want to, you don't have time to make the meat base or you don't live near the HB. That's what we call it, loving and affectionately, the HB. Uh, but so they're very, uh, you know, open and, and versatile and giving you the the different variations you can use store-bought products as That's well great. to prepare super tasty hearty dishes that are yep totally vegan cherry glazed rip cherry glazed rib rack oh, i wanted to say, say baby back ribs back. and then i, I saw rib rack and i was like blah, 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 blah. cherry glazed rib rack nashville hot popcorn chicken Ooh. kale's very fine lasagna blt couscous crust quiche and more with a chapter on bases, butters, and sauces that will elevate your vegan dishes, plus beautiful photography and entertaining stories. There are great stories in this book. Uh, They're Kale adorable. And, uh, yeah, Kale and Aubrey, uh, both born in Guam and then came to Minneapolis, so they've got lots of stories in there uh, from their youth with their family and what inspired these recipes and then growing up in the Twin Cities and, and all that stuff. So some really great stories in and here. his name is Kale. Kale. So, I mean, that really was written in the stars. Legits. Legits, it's Kale. Um, well, this book, I'm telling you, it's a glimpse of the future, and the future tastes delicious. Here they are to talk about their Rivers Butcher Cookbook, 75 plus recipes for plant-based meats and all the dishes you can make with them. It's the butcher knife-wielding brother and sister duo, Aubrey and Kale Walsh. <laughs> They make meat-free meats and cheese-free cheeses. It's the original, the OG vegan butchers from around the block, Minnesota way. Please welcome to the podcast, the superhero brother and sister duo, Kale and Aubrey Walsh. Thank you both for being here today. Hi, great to be here. Thank you for having us. Yes, yes, yes. I'm so excited to talk to you both, and we're going to dive right into your icebreaker question. So what is an old person, an elderly person trait you have taken on already in your younger years? Well, Kale is an old person now. <laughs> it's true. I am becoming the old Japanese man that I've aspired to be. Um, let's see. I think it's your walks. It's your talking walks. No, no, no. I'd say uh, maybe icing my back while I watch Price is Right in the morning. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff I was searching for right there. That's perfect. That was a, that's some Nana stuff right there. Mm -hmm. um, so good. For me, I think, I mean, so many. Wow. Where do I start? Um, but, <laughs> I feel the same. So that's why it's a good question, right? Um, I think I, I basically exclusively listen to only instrumental music now. <laughs> like, nope. No, nope, sorry, 80s, sorry, 90s, sorry, today. Is there is there like a type of instrumental music that you listen to the most yeah. that you're geared towards? Yeah, mostly jazz these days. All right, okay. Yeah. I got played, I got happy jazz, I got background jazz, I got moody jazz, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm do you have Do you have cooking jazz? You must have a playlist oh, for cooking jazz, jazz then. Of course you I do. <laughs> I love it. Mine, mine, are, mine are basic things. Like basically I want to go to bed early and then I want to get up. I woke up a couple weeks ago at like four 30 and oh. I was like, I guess I'll just like get up. And I was like, what's happening right now? Like I got out of bed and I was like, wait a minute, what, this can't be really happening where I was okay <laughs> with getting out of bed. It was, and I, I mean, I don't think I went, I wasn't in bed at like seven o'clock the night before anything, probably like nine or 10. I thought 4.30 was aggressive. I was like, please don't let this be a regular thing. The next morning it was like 5 a.m. And now it's gotten, it's back oh. to like normal, but I was very nervous. <laughs> and also loud things. Uh, we went to a concert a while ago and my husband and I were both like, this is really loud, right? And I was like, no, it's happening. It's happening. You're like stuffing napkins in your ear right right there was a concert where it was loud we were like let's just go out until the other act comes on maybe it won't be as loud and i was like that really just happened just now that's great but hey you know what wear it with a badge of honor right we're still here we get to talk about it just exactly. you know all the great you know things what we like now so yeah that's exactly right. that's exactly right well we're here to talk about the book the rivers butcher cookbook of course Ooh. 75 plus recipes for plant-based meats and all the dishes you can make with them but before we dive into the book uh, i would like to talk to you both about sort of where cooking was before herbivorous butcher sort of um 
then how veganism became part of that. Were, were you cooking before there was a herbivorous butcher? Was cooking part of your childhood? And then when did veganism uh, kind of creep into that as well? Yeah, so for me, so we're 13 years apart. Which I read in the book and yeah. my mind was blown. I've seen you both in person. I would have never guessed that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, for me, it started with veganism when I was 14. So um, I didn't know what to eat. My mom didn't know what to cook. I basically ate pasta with red sauce, um, Boca burgers. There was a mm -hmm. vegan Boca burger back then, um, tofu, tempeh, and that was it. And so it was like, for me, cooking was uh, out of necessity because I wanted, I wanted to eat more things. And so um, I got this cookbook at this, um, a uh, crazy bookstore and it was called vegan vittles and it was like my entrance into vegan meat because they had a basic seitan recipe it was just yeah. like like mock duck you know um and I just kind of started there and made more and more things and as Kale grew up like when he was young he wouldn't try anything I make he's like right. yeah, no, I'm good it's cool um <laughs> so then yeah and he comes around. Yeah. And, and for me, I, uh, before I went vegan, I, I always liked tinkering with stuff, uh, like different recipes. Uh, I, my mom just sent me a recipe that I called cabin chicken. Uh, okay. It was like a, didn't look horrible. It was like a, kind of like a herbal brown sugar glaze on like a. Why is it called cabin chicken? Is it made in a cabin? I don't know. We didn't have a cabin. You know, All right. We've never been to a cabin. I think it's, it, <laughs> it looked like a cabin, you know? It's probably uh, like saucy or something. Like okay. thinking you would eat it with, you know, the, the three bears. Yeah. There that, you go. There you go. Um, but I, you know, in that process, I, I learned, you know, that small changes in the recipe can make a, a big difference in the end result. And after I went vegan, uh, I immediately applied that to, to making the, the vegan meats. Uh, but it was just a lot more fun because instead of like, oh, I put some thyme in a soup and that was sure. a little more herbal. It was like, oh, well, I steamed this before I baked it and I got a completely different result. So, uh, yeah, it, everything kind of came together in vegan meat and I never looked back. Yeah. yeah. I definitely don't think either of us thought we would be cooking for a living. Right. Like I worked in music and although I cooked when I was younger, I like, like who eats in their twenties? Yeah. I didn't eat in my twenties. <laughs> so I thought I was going to work in music, but like I went on this, this date with this guy once and he said, so do you cook at all? I was like, absolutely not. I definitely don't even have any food in my refrigerator right now. And my husband will attest to the fact that I didn't, but he said, that's really funny because you're going to cook for a living and you're going to make a living off of it in the future. And I was like, Nope, not going to happen. Where is, is this he? your husband? Was this a date oh, with your, he was, a, I went on a date with him. Like the night before I went on a date with my husband for the first time. I was kind of dating back then, you know? Yeah. Hey, you know, come on. Yeah. So what, was he, a, was he a psychic or what did he, how did this? No, I don't know. Huh. He was just like a kind of a strange, strange thing. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Because you were like, well, can you see if we're going out on another date then? Like, what's happening here? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You didn't see that. <laughs> right? Exactly. Um, well, I I guess I, I'm... <laughs> Are you eating vegetables these days, Aubrey? You talk about not eating vegetables in the book. Um, I So I didn't eat any vegetables as a kid. Yeah. And honestly, I think I the first time I had a green bean, I was 26, like maybe asparagus. 28 broccoli easily 30 yeah 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 because my dad like hated them and no one ever i just wanted to be like my dad when i was little and so sure just never ate any vegetables but i'm still alive my bones are strong so there you go there you go and you talk about your dad kale you were eating you had like a, a history of eating ribs with your dad so tell us a little bit about that and how do you navigate it out of that then once you went vegan 
Absolutely. Uh, well, my dad and I used to travel around the country uh, on road trips, uh, looking for the best uh, ribs was one thing, but also burgers, really just about anything. We were looking sure. for the best food in any city we went to. And uh, ribs, not vegetables, not vegetables. Certainly not. Uh, <laughs> ribs was a very uh, popular thing because like a nice kind of easy day trip uh, down to St. Louis or Kansas City gets you to the best rib restaurants in the country. Um, so I really love ribs. That was like the strangely the like one of the only meats that I enjoy. Uh, so I, you know, after I went vegan, it was important that I I could make this favorite food of mine uh, in a convincing enough way to, you know, still have it be enjoyed by my dad and I. So, yeah. Can you tell Can you tell Dustin the um, Smoky House Rib story real quick? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we go. In the process of of making the uh, the rib, which was the first vegan meat I ever made, I I tried everything. I tried liquid smoke, and nothing was quite you know, giving me the flavor that I, I was looking for in the ribs that I would have in St. Louis. Uh, so the uh, the chef at the restaurant I was a server at suggested that I try smoking them. And, you know, my, my dad's apartment was was small. Uh, the, uh, like the, the hood was, was just like the behind you, like underneath the microwave. Uh-huh. Uh, and it wasn't ready for the, for the yeah. wildfire. It was... <laughs> So I, I lit up the chips and I put it under the foil. I was like, oh, it'll probably stay under the foil. It'll be cool. Uh, but no, it, the hood barely got any of it and it smoked the whole house. Uh, all my dad's clothes upstairs. Like all my all clothes, of his suits. Our dog. The dog. <laughs> everything was just, it smelled. I don't know. He, he doesn't live there anymore, but the walls probably still yeah. smell vaguely of hickory smoke. Sure. And everybody was like, have you been at a campfire recently? Yeah. And you're like, why? What, what's the smell? What? I don't understand. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I mean, we've all had our mishaps in some <laughs> form or another like that, I suppose. Well, Herbivorous Butcher started sharing these meat-free meats at farmer's markets and sort of fooling unsuspecting carnivores, which I love the unapolog- unapologetic nature of this. In the book, it's like, we got them. And they were like, well, what kind of meat is this? And you were able to talk to them about it. But how did you go then from farmer's market into the sort of, I mean, you guys are a phenomenon. Like the Herbivorous Butcher just took over. And like everyone talks about it, you know, and everyone gets excited when they get to Minneapolis to go there. So how did it go from farmer's market to where you are now? It was kind of a crazy, I mean, even for us, we're like, what? Um, so it was our, it was July. It was our second month at the farmer's market. And I was out of town for my birthday. So Kale was at the farmer's market by himself. And he called me and said, was like, hey, this guy came to our farmer's market booth. And he works at an assisted living facility. And he wants, he taught, he wants to like serve our stuff at his assisted living facility. Um, and the owner of all the facilities wants to meet you and talk to you about putting it in all of their facilities. And I'm, I'm like talking to him, I'm like, well, this sounds like a kind of a, you know, not, it's not going to happen. Yeah. 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 I get excited. And I said, well, I'm not going to be there, but like, go ahead. Cause you talked to them first, right? I or did, you called I, them. Yeah. I was I, like, go I, ahead and call them. Yeah. And I, I went there to meet with them. It was just crazy that they were serious. Like it was like a yeah. real thing. I met the CEO of this massive company and the, the head chef of this facility. And he was like, uh, you know, like what, what's the, what's the dream? Like, you know, can you guys make enough to supply all the facilities? And I was like, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually the answer would be no to that, but thank you for asking. Yeah. We, we rented by the hour. We can't do that. So right. Nice. But then we kind of said, uh, you build us our shop and a kitchen big enough, we'll supply. Ah. So um, he wanted us to do a proof of concept to make sure that it was good enough. Um, so a-, a bunch of our customers who started with us like only a month before, but just, you know, loved what we were doing. Yeah. They ended doing a Kickstarter. So that's what we did. 
So we did a Kickstarter. We raised almost $62,000. And um, for him, that was enough because it was, you know, from all over the world. And uh, Jimmy Fallon made fun of us on his show. And like, all you know, it was like all these That only guys. helped, I would imagine, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. it was like. It was like Black Friday the next day at the farmer's market. We're like, what? Amazing. <laughs> yeah. So then, yeah. So he made up the difference, which was a huge difference for building wow. a whole kitchen. But yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. Wow. It's amazing. You know, the way the universe aligns things. Speaking of the universe aligning things, you have provided uh, some meat free meats and cheese free cheeses for celebrities such as Sir Paul McCartney. And you go into it a little bit in the book. Do you want to tell us a little bit of that story? Maybe. That was <laughs> so yeah. crazy. It was that first year that we were open was like the most surreal time of my life because like we, we did Diners, Dragons and Dives. Mm -hmm in the first six months. And then one day I was just driving and I, I get a call from a number I didn't know. Uh, it was this British lady. And she was like, uh, oh yes, uh, is this Kale? And I was like, yeah. And I, I thought like I really didn't pay some debt or something. <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, the British are coming. Um, <laughs> she, was, she didn't say anything about who she was. Uh, she just said, uh, well, yes, we'll, uh, we'll expect you uh, backstage uh, tonight at six. And uh, if you could bring a meat tray, cheese tray. Um, I was like, uh, no, what? This is, I, don't think, I don't think we'll be bringing anything anywhere. And she was like, well, uh, well, Sir Paul uh, said he was very excited to try your, your stuff. Oh I almost crashed the car. Yeah. Uh, and I... <laughs> I had to pull over. I was like, uh, Sir Paul McCartney? Would that be the one? Is it another Sir Paul? Is it like a, but that was it. And uh, we like spent the whole day like making this massive meat and cheese plate that I don't know. I don't know what we expected. Yeah. But we, we brought it there. And uh, Paul was like, he was like delayed, like, so he, he couldn't like spend a lot of time saying hi to us backstage, but we had a lot of time to wait. Yeah. So much time. And uh, the green room had a bunch of free booze. So we just put him back. Yeah. We were really put nervous. We were I so get it. Nervous. I get it. And by the time he got to, he got to us, uh, things were a little hazy. Sure. But, sure. But he was so nice uh, when we got to meet him and, Good. Like, uh, uh, you, you know, you guys, everyone talks about you in, in England. Uh, we got to get you out there. And I was like, where's the real Paul? You know, <laughs> I mean, it, was that just mind blowing to you? Impossible. I haven't watched it. It's I was going to say, I was going to say, come on now to, to be talking to him, but then have him say everybody talks about you like that's crazy feeling it has really to be crazy. really crazy. wow that's so cool yeah. well i ask every uh author when i have them on and aubrey you already said vegan vittles so that was i would ask every author what your first vegan cookbook was essentially mm -hmm. like the one that you sort of had a, a moment with right it sounds like vegan vittles for you and i think kale you mentioned vegan vittles in the book as well was that also your first or was it something else I think that was my that was my first physical book, and then because I gave mine to him. Yep, and I, <laughs> and I I used a lot of well done, sis. <laughs> a lot of blog websites, like yep. I remember uh, getting a lot of inspiration from uh, Vegan Dad. I okay, I haven't heard. heard of that one. Is it still around? Still doing its Vegan uh, Dad I thing? So. I don't know, but I I had a I was clearing out some stuff in my office, and I found this folder of like all these. Like recipes that I printed out mm -hmm. that, I, that I used as bases for yep. for vegan products, and it was very nostalgic. There was a lot of vegan dad recipes, uh, like green something, I don't know. But yeah, vegan fiddles was was very inspiring because it like it, it gave like a like a framework for all these like different kinds of of meats mm -hmm. that I I didn't know you could make vegan. You know I what. It, if it didn't exist on the market, you know, why should I be able to make it at home? Which is yeah. what, what my first thought was, but 
Well, it's like back then looking at the recipe and you're like, okay, it, yep, that's gonna, it's not gonna come out like that. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, no kidding. There's a, have you guys heard of the Farm Vegetarian Cookbook? Mm -hmm. I think it's a long, when, do you recall when Vegan Vittles came out? Oh God. I mean, it's it like had a to... 70s situation. Yes. Yep. Same with the farm vegetarian cookbook. And people have said that was their first one. So it's amazing when you look at these and you see people have been doing this forever, like, yeah. and, 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 and doing it in its simplest form. And, you know, it's, it's, it's really cool to see those. I, I looked up vegan vittles. There were a few that popped up. So I got to go back and then maybe see if I can find which one you guys are talking about, but, um, cause I want to get it just to look at it. I'm so fascinated yeah. by it just to see. Um, well, let's get into the book. Chapter one is meat made without meat. You really give over the goods in this chapter, uh, giving mm -hmm. us some secrets that we're so grateful to get us fans of the reverse butcher. And I've made the chicken cutlets from here and loved them. Um, they're just so versatile. I went ahead and I used them in uh, Nana's brown paper bag fried chicken, crispy, yeah. perfectly seasoned. Also the base to make an awesome chicken sandwich so you can't go wrong. But then I also had leftover. I used them for grilled chicken breast to put on Caesar salads. I used them for a chicken noodle soup that I made. So, so many great things. But the cool part, among many, is that there was the um, the chicken broth powder, right? I'm obsessed with this powder. I now make it and keep it in my pantry. I sprinkle it on tofu when I air fry it because, you know, you don't always have time to make yourself the chicken cutlets, but I'll be like, oh, I'm going to make this tofu. I'll sprinkle this on there. We love it so much in this house. Um, so I, I thank you for that pantry staple right there. But for both of you deciding what to choose for this chapter had to sort of been, it had to be really hard after creating all these recipes for so many years. Um, what is a recipe from each of you that you sort of knew from the jump had to be in this chapter? Uh, for, for me, I, I would say I was really excited about the rib because it, it was my first. Um, and I think it's just a fantastic base to build off of. You know, it's, it's just a, you know, like a canvas you can make, anything from the smoky house rib that I used to make uh, to the Korean rib, which is the most popular in our shop. Yeah. Yeah. So stuff that I haven't even thought of yet, but I, <laughs> I wanted to create for people uh, that, that same sense that I had when I started making vegan meat, uh, specifically with the rib that you can do anything with this, you know, there's, there's no uh, limit to like how much your creativity will benefit the, the final product. Uh, so I was very excited to share the rib with people. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, it was the sham recipe. Yeah. 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 I thought it might be. Um, grew up eating spam. Loved it. I thought we would, we would like my family would eat it on Friday nights. We'd watch TGIF. So family matters, full house, a little bit of spam and rice with ketchup. Yep. It was a dream. So just like being able to put that in there and then knowing that people on Guam and like other little Aubrey's out there mm -hmm. can eat vegan spam. Yeah. And I love the name of it. Sham too. It's I, I never had, I was going to say sham as a kid. I never had spam as a kid, but I'm so curious about it. And I'm going to make the sham recipe to see. Um, Cause I've just been curious about it all this time. Speaking of TGIF family matters. Wow. Do you recall there was a younger child that disappeared in the middle of that. Yeah. It was okay. like, yeah, it was someone's, someone's kid, like an aunt or something. And well, she was their, their daughter. She was like the younger oh. sister and the actual daughter. But I guess she only did when they started introducing Urkel. Yeah. They took her off the show. I just listened to a podcast on this the other day. That's why I was like, hold on. Sitcoms are crazy like that. Bananas. Yeah. <laughs> a little TGI Friday there. Well, there's so many great things in this. We have the ribs, the sham, the butcher burger, porterhouse steak, ground beef, pork chops, Milano salami, uh, the chamorro chorizo, deli bologna. Bologna, that word's always hard to read because that's definitely not how it's spelled. Uh, the brat, uh, foie gras, foie, foie gras foie gr <laughs> really struggling here. <laughs> go ahead say it for us please foie gras there we go <laughs> my 
goodness, fish sticks. And uh, another one I'm excited to make is the pepperoni as well. So I can't wait to get into that one. Mm. Uh, chapter two is main meals featuring that Nana's brown paper uh, bag fried chicken I mentioned. I think next on my to-do list is the cherry glazed rib rack. Speaking of those ribs and the versatility, what is a recipe you would tell someone who just bought this book to make for their friends for dinner from the main meals chapter? Oh man. Well, I kind of feel like kale's very fine lasagna. Is that in that chapter? Yeah. It yeah. is. Yeah. I feel like that is a absolute crowd pleaser. Just once you like put a pan of it down on a table with a group, there's nothing left. It's I actually think as you say that, you just said crowd pleaser. Isn't there a chapter called crowd pleasers? And that might actually be where that was. <laughs> yeah. For a crowd, we got the lasagna in there. <laughs> so you knew where you wanted that to be, really. Yeah. You where you wanted that to be. What is a chapter? You know? What is a chapter, really? Just places that were told by publishers to put things in a bit, book, ultimately. Um, I'd say for me, I, I don't know. If if not the if the lasagna is in another chapter, <laughs> uh, I think the the cherry glazed uh, uh, ribs is a, is a fantastic. I love it. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, there's so, there's so many good things. There's another. Uh, uh, there's lots of ribs in here. You've got the lunch plate plate kula. No, that's pork. Pronounce it for me. Kalua. Uh, Kalua. Yeah, straight up Kalua. Yeah. Guys, I did not eat my Wheaties, apparently. <laughs> or I'm having another old trait pop in, and I am in denial about needing reading glasses is what's happening. Five spice rib tips, sizzling Malibu chicken. Oh, yeah, that's good. Easy, cheesy, supreme pizza bowls. I mean, this recipe, this chapter is packed full of main meals that people can make on weeknights and uh, enjoy for dinner with friends or family. And chapter three takes us to sides. I love a good side chapter. Um, it's a list, you know, that vegans have used for years to live off of essentially at Thanksgiving. And I made the cheesy garlicky truffle smashed potatoes in here. They're very addictive, delicious. What's another star in this chapter, both for you, for the sides chapter? Um, I personally love the garlic fried rice. For me, that's like a staple that I, I make it twice a week. I always hope to have leftovers and it's just like, you can eat it with anything. Yeah. And you can eat it cold if you're just, it's late. You just need a bite of something. Yeah. It's fantastic. That's very good. And what I love about fried rice too, is sometimes when you, if you have some like leftover rice sitting around and just some like vegetables or whatever that you just need, you can just make up a fried rice right away. It's delicious. Yeah. What's a side for you, Kale? I, I mean, I, just like I used to do with the meats, I, you know, I use the garlic fried rice as a base for a lot of what I eat now out of, you know, when I'm just done with work. But I found this great uh, vegan fish sauce at the Asian market. Hmm. It, it's like a, it's like a, it's like Bigfoot. It, it appears so rarely and, and I always buy them out. This is true. I, I put some of that in with the rice and now it's like the, like the best Thai fried rice you ever had. So I don't know. If not that, the cheesy potatoes. I mean, it's, yeah. It's yeah. Fun. I mean, you can't go wrong with a potato. Yeah. yeah. So good. Well, chapter four is soups. And I've been dying to make the Chinese ramen with sweet and sour fried oh. tofu. It Sounds is so, so good. Ugh. Uh, and, and what are a couple soups in this chapter you find yourself making when it's soup season like is there something from this chapter you still make yeah um so for me um it's the uh the minnesota wild rice soup i at home my husband and i call it chud i don't know why but um that sounds very appealing yeah i mean there was a horror <laughs> movie called chud in the 80s and it's i think that's why but um, the chud season in our house goes october through mid-november it's very specific um so we wait so chud means soup no it's just chud was a horror movie and it was like oh this, okay this like um liquid that traveled around the small town or something it's sounding actually very familiar to me and i'm looking it up because i am yeah. a horror movie fan and as you said that now i was like i think i know exactly i want to see the cover of it to see if i know what you're talking about yeah it's like a 
creepy lady yeah. guy coming out of a yep a manhole, right? Yep, exactly. Yes, I'm familiar. So, anyways, soup. <laughs> Chud season. Um, I just I just made the devil's doll for myself uh, a few days ago, actually. Um, I didn't do the fancy uh, uh, Dungar smoking method at the end because I was lazy, but <laughs> it would have made it much better. But the uh, the mini tomka, uh, the that weird oh, hybrid so tomka, is is really nice. It's just a uh, I I've been lazy at home, so I've been doing the easier stuff. Um, hey, yeah, that so recipe it- uh, got a little bit more going on than I. That I have got energy for most. Nights. Yeah, listen, when you work in food, cooking for yourself becomes like the big task. I used to do private clients and I had to stop because I found myself not taking care of myself in the food yeah. world at all. I was just like, what can I put in the microwave essentially or pick up at a store? Which, you know, isn't always bad. That's fine. But it's like when you're always doing that. Can you explain to the rest of the world what a Juicy Lucy is? Mm-hmm. I know what a Juicy Lucy yeah. is, but everyone else might not know. And then you turned it into a chili. So tell us about the Juicy Lucy chili. Yeah. Uh, so it's a, uh, it's the object of much controversy here in Minneapolis yeah. uh, <laughs> as to it where sure it was born. Uh, but wherever you find it, it's always uh, molten hot cheese that's like injected between two beef patties mm-hmm. and kind of molded, so it cooks and. The, the cheese just gets so hot. And then you, you take a bite and you just burn everything that it touches, yeah, you yeah. know? Uh, and, you know, I, I was thinking about doing a Juicy Lucy, like the actual sandwich for the cookbook, but I don't want to subject anyone to that pain. So yeah. I, it's a lawsuit waiting to happen. Right? It is. I mean, so, truly, yeah. it's, it's your McDonald's coffee. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can just get the same experience with the Juicy Lucy chili, you know, mm-hmm. without suffering. Yeah. Uh, you can put buns if you want, then it's close. But the Juicy Lucy chili, uh, we made it at our last uh, veg fest here in Minneapolis, uh, in St. Paul. But it's uh, it's really nice because I find with chilies, I'm always, I'm always like missing a little something. You know, people always put cheese or sour cream on top. And I thought, what if you just mix it in? What happens? Yeah. And it, uh, <laughs> it turned out really nice. And I added some weird stuff like uh, ketchup and like mustard in there to kind of get the whole juicy Lucy flavor. And I don't know when I made it. I didn't expect at first to put it in the cookbook. I was like, "This is this is a little weird," but it oh, actually oh, turned out really nice. So I uh, that's a that's a keeper. Yeah, the first Good. time I had it, I was like, "Okay, I'm just gonna like take my bowl and then I'll put a tiny. I'll like take a spoon with a little bit of ketchup and mustard." But then it was so good. It just like adds to it. And I just, I put it all over the place after that. Was, well, like, and you're right though about mixing it in. It all gets mixed in anyways. So like, right. come on, you know. Uh, chapter five is titled For the Crowd. And we've got items in here like, oh, I don't know. Kale's very fine lasagna. <laughs> and the pinky up smash potato hot dish. Getting in that Minnesota again. Ritzy yeah. chicken casserole. And I actually got... I got a fondue set for Christmas um, and I, I had had the page like marked on here to go to the fondue. And I, I specifically was like, well, not, which honestly fondue these days, like that feels like a very seventies vibe to me. I'm here for it. But now after COVID and everything, I'm like, who's going to share fondue with me? Is anyone going to share fondue? And then I was like, well, it's just me and my husband. So I guess it doesn't matter, but I got this fondue dish is my point. And I was so excited to make this. I had all the ingredients on hand, like, already so it's called fondue you want fondue you want to dip um so everybody just easy and accessible in the book that's a great one to look at what are a couple items that you like we've mentioned the lasagna we've mentioned the fondue a couple more items that are just crowd pleasers in this book that you put them down and people go bananas yeah the hobbits of the shire shepherd's pie Oh, so good. Oh. There's some um, some dark beer in that recipe, and it just, like, it deglazes the pan so nicely and just, it it really just makes the, makes the sauce pop, and it's so incredible. I love it. And every time, like, we've had a lot of customers come in and say, you know, I made this Hobbits of the Shire thing for my family because we were watching Lord of the Rings, and it was 
that's exactly why I made it the first time I ever made it because we were yeah. doing the, we're just plowing through all of them one day and it's really you were good. inspired exactly <laughs> I'm trying to remember what else is in the crowd pleaser because now now the lines have been blurred for me we got the mighty chicken enchilada casserole Oh, yeah. BLT couscous crust quiche, yeah. banana pecan French toast bake. Oh, yeah, Aubrey did most of these in this chapter. I cook uh, for a lot of people all the time. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and they're very happy, clearly. Yeah, <laughs> I mean the ritzy chicken is a it's a piece of modern art in a in a casserole yes. dish. It's yes. a... <laughs> the ultimate chef's kiss, ritzy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just it's it's, it's beautiful. It's yes. Beautiful. It's, uh, well, we. We give the words hot dish in here. Do you want to talk a little bit about what a hot dish is for everyone listening if they're not from Minnesota uh, way? Yeah, hot dishes are, for the most part, kind of awful. Like, <laughs> the reason, <laughs> it's a church basement food. And yeah. I feel like I probably have never had a proper one um, because... I don't think I had, we moved to the United States when I was, when I was 13. Uh, I don't think I really had one in the first year. And then I went vegan. So it was kind of all over after that. But um, the first time I made one, I just like took a recipe online, Minnesota hot dish recipe, you know, subbed in Morningstar crumbles and right. But it just tastes like hamburger helper. <laughs> and then the, you bake it off though. That's what you do, right? Is it like a casserole essentially? Yeah. It's it's a casserole that has tater tots on top. There we go. Okay. Yeah. But the right. problem is, like, you can't really, unless you deep fry your tater tots at home, they're not going to taste crispy and delicious if they're just baked. Yeah. 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 Hence the on potatoes on top. So much better. Pinky up. Kind of the pinky yeah. up as well. I mean, <laughs> come on. Well, chapter six is snacks. And I love me snacks. And this chapter has... What I want with snacks with smoky Reuben croquettes, Nashville hot popcorn chicken, mm. Minnesota style cheesy artichoke dip, Minnesota style. What's what makes this artichoke dip Minnesota style? Mayonnaise. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just mayonnaise. There we go. I mean, I feel like I did that. I'm from Michigan and I feel like I even did uh I remember making some artichoke dip back in the day with mayonnaise too. So us yeah. vegans, we got that mayonnaise. We can do it too. Exactly. Come on. Well, what favorite snacks then? Besides me, I know I'm your favorite snack. But what's <laughs> a favorite uh snack for both of you from this chapter? I am going with actually Kale's tofu appetizer recipe. It looks so good in this book. It is. So you want, cool. you want to tell them what it's based I on? I can't believe you would take that from me. What? It's <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. We introduced you to the rest That's of the It's also my favorite. It's, uh, <laughs> I think it's the perfect food, uh, the tofu appetizer, because mm -hmm. we, we've been enjoying it at our favorite restaurant in the whole world, which just happens to be in our, uh, our own town. It's called Lucky Dragon. And I... I, I, I don't have words to describe quite how they do it. It's just, oh, God, look at it. And it's so beautiful. Oh, yeah. If you're watching, if you're not watching the podcast, you want to go watch it now if you're just listening, because I'm holding up the photo and it is gorgeous. Yes. And it's, uh, I don't know. I, I made it to be paired with the birthday oils that are in the book. Um, and once I, once I crack the code on how Luann uh, at Lucky Dragon does it? I I felt like I, you know, had done something that I shouldn't have done. Like I like I saw past the veil for a second, and like now I was gonna be struck blind. Uh, and so so Kale like so we love Lucky Dragon so much, and um, that Kale got the owner's face tattooed on his back. Oh my goodness! She doesn't know this. She's like in her seventies. She's a real sweet lady and um i was just sorry i was looking down because i wanted to show everyone. yes let's see oh let me put you see her yeah let me put you guys up as the main screen so we can get a good old look from that oh gosh i can't do it never mind we can see it though. yeah yeah right there's good right there stay right there yeah oh my yeah. gosh that's amazing dragons never say die that is that is some some 
loyal dedication there. I oh, love yeah. it. We're gonna tell her someday. Someday. Not soon. I mean, yeah, I was gonna say tell her soon. Tell her soon. <laughs> Well, that, uh, that's a, uh, what a treat to include that in your book then too. That's a, uh, I know that moment when you sort of crack the code on something and you're like, oh, should I know this? But then it's also what a great tribute to pay. What an honor to pay there. So that, yeah. that's, that's very lovely. Yeah. Chapter seven is the sandwiches, the mighty sandwich with offerings like the Philly eggs, Benedict, the Philly eggs, Benedict burrito and the very best mozzarella stick sandwich. Please tell us about the very best mozzarella stick sandwich. Oh my God. It's so good. I mean, I, I can't believe I never like thought about this a long time ago, but because for so long we couldn't eat mozzarella sticks until we start, you know, we started making them at our fried chicken place. Right. But it's just, you know, it's two pieces of bread and you put a ton of mozzarella cheese in the middle and you kind of mm. like squish it down a little bit on the sides and then you batter and fry the entire thing. Yeah. And then you yep. just eat the whole thing. Big mozzarella patty, essentially. Oh, it's just like the, the the tastiest thing in the world. And I felt so naughty eating it because I didn't want to. I like, so Kale and I, when we were writing the cookbook, he lived in, we lived in a fourplex and he lived upstairs. So I would always make something and then it was during the pandemic and I would bring it up and set it on his, right in front of his door so they could grab Aww. it. Nobody and, was cooking for me. Yeah. <laughs> I lived but, in the wrong spot. Go ahead. But we didn't, I didn't want to like share that one. And I think <laughs> you in the corner of it and I felt, yeah. felt bad, but you know what? Oh, that's funny. So yeah, good. Does. And uh, for me, it's, it's definitely the Philly. I love the Philly so much. We, uh, we just did a video of the Philly not that long ago and it was, God, oh, it's beautiful. Just, the more cheese you put on there, the better. Yeah. You can just make a revolting mass of caramelized onions and, oh, and meat. And oh, God. It's just so juicy and drippy the way, yeah. exactly the way it should be. Yeah. What cheese in the book do you use? Is it there? I know there's a cheese sauce in the back. Do you use that on the Philly? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Delicious. There's, um, so I used to, did you guys have Bennigan's in Minneapolis? Did you ever have those there? We had one. We never okay. had it here, though. I waited tables there long ago in my early twenties and um, in Michigan. And there was a burger called the wheelhouse burger. And it was literally a burger with marinara sauce, but then mozzarella, a wheel of mozzarella, like, uh, so not mozzarella sticks, but like a wheel shaped, like a burger of deep fried mozzarella. That oh, burger yeah. was my, Oh, just ever. And when I saw this sandwich, I was like, Oh, mozzarella on any sandwich. Just like that. It's just mm -hmm. like out of this world. So good. Oh, and so dangerous, but I love it. <laughs> well, chapter eight takes us to bases, butters, sauces, and dressings. And these are actually sort of my favorite chapters in books because I feel it really gives home cooks a foundation to sort of build uh, some cooking confidence as they move along. They, they get to create pantry items and they can use them for the recipes in the book, but then they also find ways to use them at home. A perfect example is that chicken broth powder that I've told you already, you know, I use regularly. I love it. Um, and there's great stuff in here, like beef broth concentrate, cheese sauce base, uh, kale's pizza dough, vegan buttermilk, better butter, sambal mayo, creamy ranch, warm bacon dressing, brunchy brunch, hollandaise sauce, butcher strength, Worcestershire, and kale's birthday oil, LLC. Honey, tell the listeners about this birthday oil, kale. Oh, oh good. It's Get into it. It was designed uh, for the tofu appetizer. Uh, I made it one year for Avi's birthday because I, I didn't have any money to actually buy something. But instead, I, I, I made this, this wonderful uh, savory chili oil that has evolved through the years. Um, but it's because a lot of the chili oils on the market are, are either like just spicy or maybe like really salty. And you have to like go to the back section of the Asian grocery store to get the really good ones. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to make something that was just a savory bomb that uh, wasn't just a chili oil. It was also, it's like a condiment, you know? And all those things combined in the birthday oils and it's, oh, it's dangerous to have around because it, you put it on anything. 
It really goes good on anything. anything. I just had hot pot the other night, and then I mixed some in with uh, some sesame paste uh -huh. and uh, a little sweet soy sauce, and it was just the, the best hot pot dipping sauce. I well, believe it. It's real good. But with the tofu appetizer, it becomes this unstoppable force of savory flavor. I tell you, I haven't made it yet because I know I'm going to love it. And I'm just going to want to make it all the time. And it's just going to be yeah. another reason for me to be like, well, we'll just put some oil on this. We'll put some of that oil on this. You know, it's like, I, I'm not oil free. I enjoy the use of oil, but I also try not to overdo it. Right. Especially as we're talking about getting older, but um, you know, it's, it's just, I just know it's going to, I'm going to make it. Don't get me wrong. It'll happen. But like, I gotta be, I, I gotta be ready for it and, and pace myself after I do. Uh, okay. Aubrey, is there a staple for you in this chapter that you keep on hand regularly? Yeah, that beef broth concentrate. Yeah. It's so good. We So it's it's actually what we originally used um, to boil our steaks in. Okay. And we would, when we worked at the um, community kitchen, we just like didn't really eat that much. And we always were tired and because we were working constantly but we had like a small bowl of this broth. We would call it, um, what do we call it life juice? Life broth. Life broth. Mm -hmm. And it just like, it just brought you back to life. So mm -hmm. I always keep it on hand. Yeah. It's also a hangover cure. Hangover cure. Uh, it's gotten me out of a lot of sticky mornings. Yep. <laughs> yep. Sure. Yeah, it's amazing. We had in culinary school, we would have uh, their was baking day and or baking week and we would you know we we're baking all the time trying all these baked goods and there was a chef there who always made his famous miso soup during that week because like we all just kind of felt gross after eating all the, the first couple days you're like yay and then you're kind of like i don't want to do this anymore and they would make the soup and you'd have this like nourishing broth with these delicious vegetables and seaweed in it you were like oh my gosh i feel alive again this is great so yeah. i get it broth has the magic in it well this is the part where we talk about it's your book brag, essentially. So by that, I mean, I want you to brag. But if you're not comfortable bragging, think of it as this. Tell me something you're most proud of when it comes to this book. Oh, man. Um, I guess for me, I'm, I'm, I am most proud of the fact that it has a lot of family recipes in it and stuff that I grew up eating with my grandma and, you know, grandma's I don't know my our our nana didn't write any recipes down mm -hmm. so it was just remembering what they tasted like and and the, everything about it the emotion of eating it and I just feel like I was able to capture nana's recipes and um I think she would be really proud if she was still here and um yeah just just making making her proud makes me proud yeah, I love that. That's very special. Um, I'd say I'm I'm most proud of, uh, like I touched on earlier, on helping to cultivate uh, that that cooking moment for people where they they realize that you know it's it's not just a recipe that you follow. It's you know all the other creativity you put into it. You know, it's putting your own family traditions and splicing them. You know, with these bases that we've we've made. And, you know, helping to create like new food memories for, for people. And that's very exciting to me is, you know, because we can just eat all the time and, you know, not think much of it, but like a, like a home cooked meal that someone really put a lot of time into that, you know, through the years you, you make again and again and pass on to the next generation. That's, that's really, that's, that's really something to me. So to be able to, have the opportunity to do that was was very exciting. I love that. Those are great book brags. And that is the Herbivorous Butcher Cookbook, 75 plus recipes for plant-based meats and all the dishes you can make with them. Now, are you ready for your rapid fire baker's dozen round of questions? Yeah. Yes. Fantastic. And you'll you can answer, you'll you both should answer each of them. So we'll go through them and you can you can answer, you can both answer them. So number one, barbecue sauce or hot sauce? Hot sauce. Barbecue. Aha. Uh -huh. uh, number two, fate. You got, you got, I'm going to ask you to pick a favorite child here, but favorite cheese free cheese at the herbivorous butcher? Provolone. Uh, evening in Marrakesh. It's a. 
Say again. Uh, it's an evening in Marrakesh, you know, like you find at the grocery store. Yeah, <laughs> nice evening in Marrakesh. It's a special cheese that doesn't exist uh, in the real world, but it's a it's a smoked habanero and orange peel uh, in a Havarti base. It's that sounds amazing. Beautiful. That sounds so, very good. Uh, number three is what's a favorite special that you've had on the menu at the HB? Oh boy, that's hard. Um, so the Mongolian beef. Mm. Yeah, mm. It's so good. Um, we did this Mapo tofu once, and I still think about it sometimes. You got to bring them both back then. Uh, number four, how do you feel about clowns? <laughs> them love them i was a clown like four times as a child no clowns yeah uh, clowns are these are I, I was really hoping for opposite answers on this specific <laughs> question so i i, I appreciate I that very much so i tortured him with them because i yeah. love them <laughs> so he's traumatized and you're like they're great best thing ever you pull out a red nose right now and pop it on uh I got a weird one. If you had to swap your legs with the legs of an animal, what animal would you pick? Kangaroo, obviously. Mm, very good. Mm, turtle. Also <laughs> for fairy tur I love this. Uh, what's the weirdest thing in your fridge right now? Um, preserved lemons. Oh. Yeah. Right. I got this. Uh, I got this weird uh, Chinese ham. I found at the grocery store in the frozen section. And okay. it's beautiful, but it's weird. All right. <laughs> what is your favorite season? Summer. Autumn. On the count of three, each just say one word. One, two, ah! three. Microwave. Great. <laughs> Just wanted to see what would happen. Your brother and sister sit next to each other. All right. Jeez. What did you say? <laughs> What's a must-have tool for each of you in the kitchen? Oh God, there's so many of them. Um, uh, my my baby whisk. I have this eatsy weensy whisk. Yes. Yes. I brought it to Kara Levitt. We were on the news this morning. I love it so much. It's the best it's thing ever. Just like just a little just. You can whisk in a ramekin if you want to. It's so good. Yeah. So good. Uh, I got I got my old faithful rubber spatula. Yep. Also a very good one. Both good choices. Uh, favorite spice to cook with? Oh, boy. Um, gosh. I think turmeric is like, that's still considered a spice, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I feel like it, um, it turns things into a flavor that you don't, it just like mixes differently with different things. It's really good. I think, uh, for me right now, uh, Sichuan peppercorn. Mm, Big that's spicier, right? That's a, that's the numbing. That's the numbing. That's the numbing. Yes. You're crazy. Yes. I need to get some. I'm, I'm, isn't it funny we say that's the numbing one? I'm like, yes, I need to get some. I need to get some. <laughs> uh, what's um, one must in your morning routines? A treadmill. Yeah. 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 Treadmill. Same. All right. Favorite <laughs> pasta shape? Bucatini. Mm. Oh, so messy, but it's just the best. And it's just a little doubles as a straw if you want it to. It's great. This is a sauce vessel, basically. Mm hmm. Oh, angel hair. I love that one too. I want to have angel hair tonight, actually. Uh, shout out, this is your last one. Very well done, by the way. Shout out to a current favorite local vegan business. Oh, I'm going to shout out to Francis. It's our new um, vegan burger joint. And oh, I love it. And um, they were a food truck, and now they're a restaurant of brick and mortar, and it's so fun and exciting. That's great. Um, I'm really excited for, uh, well, I'm a THC baby, but I'm excited to try the new stuff they're cooking up at this uh, this THC kitchen in South Minneapolis. I'm so curious to see. I, oh, I don't know. I get, I get real high real fast. You know, so <laughs> delicious. 
but I'll, I'm willing to try. It's a very lightweight situation for me, I have to say as well. In my early 20s, I don't know how I did some of the things that I did, but okay. now if it's, it's one bite, I'm like, I need to know what's in it, how much, and I need an hour to see exactly what happens. We can't get too crazy here. Yeah. <laughs> not trying to peel myself up off the floor. Is the THC place <laughs> open yet? It's not open yet or it is? No, not quite. No, okay. Have you seen, yeah. is it all vegan or is it not all vegan? Some all vegan. vegan options. All vegan. Have you seen the menu yeah. yet? Have they posted that? No, it's actually, okay. but it's um, being opened by the owner of Fruit to Rise, which okay. um, they did first markets and stuff. And then the owner of the former restaurant Fig and Farrow okay. that it closed during the pandemic. But yeah, so they're teaming up to do this. It's called, Jun I think it's called Juniper. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, that was your um your rapid fire. Very well, very well done. Uh, and of course, just thank you both for being here. And everyone, you can follow the adventures of Herbivorous Butcher. And tell me if I get any of these wrong, but here uh, you can follow them at the Her the Herbivorous Bee on Instagram. But also be sure to follow all their their vegan fried chicken joint as well. Herby Butcher Fried Chicken at Herby Butcher SFC. Irby Butchers yes. FC. There we go. So at Irby Butchers FC and also their nonprofit farm sanctuary, Herbivorous Acres at Herbivorous Acres. And before I let you both go, just give our listeners a quick summary of each of those. Irby Butchers Fried Chicken and Herbivorous Acres. Yeah. So um, Irby Butchers Fried Chicken was something that uh, it's we it's vegan KFC. You know, it's buckets of fried chicken. Um, there's biscuits and mashed potatoes and gravy and corn. And it's just like a, it's kind of a dream and sandwiches, just like incredible fried chicken sandwiches. Vegans. It's all the stuff you never thought you would have. Basically Aubrey and Kale are making sure you have it. So there's <laughs> yeah. no excuse. I mean, it's like our childhood thing. Like I yeah. missed him being born because I wanted to go to KFC. So my aunt took me. So, yeah. and now look what that did for you. That's great. I know. Yeah. Now we, we, we're, we're trying to recreate that for other people. Uh, exactly. Miss births of Missed siblings. Miss births of siblings. Uh, is a fried chicken. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and our River Sacres is our uh, nonprofit farm sanctuary in Scandia, Minnesota. Uh, we just had our first uh, public event. Yes. Uh, very good. And it was, it was fantastic. We had a great turnout. Um, and yeah, we're hoping to have a lot more of those soon. Uh, maybe some events. We always do some fun fundraisers and stuff for them. So yeah. there should be some, some fun stuff on the calendar for this year. And uh, how many animals do we you have on the sanctuary at this time? Ooh. Okay. There's, if you include all of the farm cats, mm -hmm. I think that there is nine, 19 Awesome. But there's cats, you know, they, they new ones pop up and we don't know where they come from. So mm -hmm. sure. I mean, hey, and then more come after that and just, you know, yeah. it just kind of keeps on rolling. Yeah. Well, that's great. And uh, you had a fun announcement this morning on TV. So uh, I believe you've taken over ownership of Jay Selby. So please tell us more for the listeners that are not in St. Paul, Minnesota area. Let them know what Jay Selby's is and why they should visit when they're in the Twin Cities. Uh, Jay Selby's has been a local institution uh, in vegan dining for, well, since we were open. Since we opened our shop in 2016, awesome. uh, they opened just a few months after us. And, you know, since then, uh, uh, Matt, uh, the, the previous owner, just he, he built something pretty beautiful. You know, he, he got a, a bunch of really good people together to make food that everyone loves. Uh, it's just a, it's a nice, you know, easy to approach menu for if you're new to vegan food or if you've been vegan for a while, you, there's something for everyone. And uh, we're adding a little bit touches here and there not really changing anything because people love it as it is but just summing out some of our stuff for you know some some stuff that they've they've had or things that uh, the chef asked me for help with um, so yeah I'm, I'm, I'm on the line I'm, I'm in yeah. the trenches cooking cooking on the weekends uh, wow, we're starting to run soon so it's uh we're having a lot of fun over there right now. yeah uh, and 
right before we took over, they hired a, um, an incredible pastry chef, Chef Brian, and he is making some just out of this world stuff. He made a vegan challah yesterday and nice. he's just, I'm so excited he for made, everything. He made the make. savory cinnamon roll last week that wow. just blew my mind. It was like, instead of like cinnamon, it was sausage and caramelized onions in this yes. roll. I didn't know you could make that. It's ridiculous. <laughs> right. I love that. Yeah. Well, awesome. There you have it, everybody. Jay Selby's congratulations on that. Everybody needs to visit and get some goods there, Some get their eat on. And we've told everyone where on social media they can find everything, but where can they find the both of you on social media? Um, I'm a sister butcher. Yeah, and I'm at brother underscore butcher. I there you go. Sister underscore butcher too. Yeah. yeah. If you found him, you can find me. Yeah. Myself. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, I know everyone listening here, you're going to want to get your hands on some goods from the Herbivorous Butcher. And you can go to the herbivorousbutcher.com and order all of the things from the butcher shop. And of course, get yourself a copy of the Herbivorous Butcher Cookbook everywhere books are sold right now. Aubrey and Kel, I have to tell you both, from the bottom of my heart, you have both always been so kind, generous, and supportive to me and all that I've done. So I, as I have you both here, I want to thank you both for that. And it means a lot to me yeah. uh, to have you both here today and get to chat with you. And I just really appreciate it. And congratulations on the continued success. It's just so cool to watch everything you're doing expand. You're getting more vegan food out there all the time. And I know you're changing the world and changing people's minds. And I just appreciate you taking the time today. Thanks for being here. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. so much fun. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Keep On Cooking. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and leave us a review if you like the podcast. It helps a lot. Yeah. And get more information on the podcast, Dustin's Cookbooks, the Vegan Rody series, and sign up for our newsletter at veganrody.com. And of course, follow us at The Vegan Rody on all social media platforms. Now get in the kitchen and keep on cooking. And hey, remember, it's nice to be nice. This has been a Muzzy Cat production. <laughs>